Greetings Courtsiders, Andy Burns here, welcome to the Courtside Podcast, this is episode 17 and today we're going to be focusing on pathways in tennis. Uh, We're in for a real treat today because my guest today is Sarah Borwell who has had a fantastic career playing tennis. She reached British number one in doubles and uh, she trained leading up to that point over in the US through the collegiate system. Sarah more recently has uh, set up uh, Tennis Smart, which is a brilliant organisation trying to help talented young players explore their pathway options that lie ahead for them, particularly exploring in and around the US collegiate system. So if you've got a talented son or daughter, talented young player on your hands who's uh, considering whether a move to the States might be an option in their future, then can I guarantee you, you need to listen in to this podcast because the, the wisdom and the advice and the uh, perspectives you're going to get from Sarah uh, are going to stand you in good stead. So welcome to today's podcast. My guest today is Sarah Borwell. My name is Andy Burns and this is the Courtside Podcast. So, Sarah Ball, welcome to Courtside. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, and um, for our listeners, where where are you on this interview on the planet? I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. Wow. In Maryland, so east coast of the U.S. Yeah. And is the weather good? I can see it shining through because we're on Skype, but is the weather all right? Yes. We survived the crazy winter, and it's we've got blue skies, sunshine, a nice cool 70 degrees. So nice. we made it through, so we're happy. And I'm detecting a rather cultured accent there, one like my own. Where, where, where do you hail from? Well, I'm from Middlesbrough originally. Um, but as most Americans couldn't understand my accent, it, I started just slowing things down. So with yep. you, no doubt, by the end of the podcast, no one will be able to understand either of us. So. We'll, we'll try and drop in a few colloquialisms as well. Yeah. Um, I, I, I had it the, at the same when I moved down to, to Surrey back when I was uh, early 20s. And... Um, I was doing youth work at the time, and the guy, so he had to do a lot of presentations. And a chap pulled me one side and said, I need you to half the speed with which you talk at, and then when you're speaking too slow, slow it down again. <laughs> so- it's, true. it's true. Well, I just know my, like, Dan Kernan, who yeah. uh, is at Soto Tennis Academy, when he would speak with his Geordie friends, yeah. I wouldn't be able to understand them. So it's <laughs> amazing trying to explain to Americans how if you go 10 minutes down the road from me, it's a different yeah. accent, and it's still just as difficult to understand yeah my, my uh, brother married a girl from the deep south and so the kind of the slow draw and then she encounters our family she she just switches off and asks my yeah. brother to translate afterwards yeah she, <laughs> she'll need help so so for our listeners um uh, kind of what what is it that you're involved in right now before i go into your journey of tennis what are you involved in right now in the world of tennis um, nothing on court anymore no um we just look after all british juniors basically with every transition so many people think there's only one pathway for them and that's the pro tour yeah. which majority of us can't make at a young age mm-hmm. so we just make it very clear with tennis smart that there's actually four pathways yes you can go on the tour but you can also go to an american university a british university yeah. or you can stay in the tennis industry yeah. so just trying to stop the 50 percent dropout rate that we have at 15 because yeah. That's when players start getting a bit stressed about GCCs, which are coming up and questioning what's the point of playing tennis, spending all this money if I'm not going to be the next Andy Murray yeah, yeah. anyway. Yeah. So so what was what was your journey uh, in tennis from picking up the racket? Because uh, there are some significant highlights in your tennis career. Yeah, I got. I was really lucky, to be honest. I grew up in Middlesbrough at... Uh, and that's where you were lucky, because you grew up in Middlesbrough? Well, yes, I was a smog monster, so <laughs> very lucky. But uh, thankfully, a, a club opened up for 10 minutes from our house mm-hmm. when I was quite young. And it was, well, it still is. It's like my second home. An yep. incredible group of young coaches who ended up, have gone off to do other things and have been kind of the leaders in what they've done. And just a huge group of juniors, so all of my age group, and we went through it all together because it was it was more social. So the members were great. We all would hang out at the club on the weekends and everything. And 
and that's kind of what kept me in mm-hmm. the sport of tennis. I didn't particularly enjoy the competing. I found it incredibly stressful. My Joe Cunliffe, who works at the LTA now, I used to travel with her, and, she, and she'd be like, you, you would go quiet weeks in advance of a tournament because I'd be so worried about it. Even though my parents put zero pressure on me, yeah. and I, they just said, have fun. But it was the social side of the tennis club with the great coaches who were developmental but also knew that were kids and so we had to have a balance with yeah. academics yeah for tennis. some but for someone who found competing stressful you you became british number one at doubles yeah so you must have I, must have been able to manage that in somewhere hold it in yeah, tension. I, I i got lucky really and it's kind of why tennis smart came about with just I didn't particularly enjoy juniors. Mm. My parents, thankfully, were incredible. And we just happened to meet someone who said, you need to get yourself off to America. It's amazing. And it was at a time when not, it wasn't really well known. There was no internet. So we yeah. couldn't just go on and Google University of Houston. So it was kind of jumping into the unknown. Um, and that just gave me more confidence where I knew that I wasn't, I didn't even have these dreams of wanting to go pro. I yeah. just, I don't even know what I was thinking back then as a junior. I just liked hanging out with my friends at the tennis club. Yeah. Um, got to America and the Americans aren't as pessimistic and as reserved as we tend to be. They're very gung-ho, slightly over the top with things, but they do instill a lot of confidence yeah. into you. And it was a nice blend between the British sensibilities and the Americans. And with competing on a regular basis in America, having everything paid for, having a support team, I kind of then grew into my game. Um, Mm. And that was after, at 15, Nigel Garton, who was my coach until, well, for like 10 years or more, um, he just said, just keep being aggressive, keep Mm. serving big, keep going for it, because it will go in. And I remember saying, well, when will it start going in? And he's like, you'll probably peak when you're 21. And I was 15 at the time. <laughs> and 21 obviously seems like you're ancient. So well I was old. like, okay. But he was right. He said, when I was 21, that's when I really started doing mm. incredibly well in college, moving up the rankings there. And then um, after getting top 10 in college, I had a, a guy, a coach who's at UNLV, and he said, I want to help you out. I have sponsors if you want to go pro. Wow. So I based myself in Las Vegas for a year and a half and (laughs) started off my tour there. I I didn't realise that Las Vegas was a hotbed of tennis. Uh, Maybe kind of uh, fake Elvises and uh, Sinatra and stuff. Well, there's Andre Agassi there. Very true. I stand corrected. I guess everywhere in America really is kind of when it's sunny and you can just you can go to a court outside with floodlights and it's free and yeah. it's a really nice hard court. Yeah. So it's, it's hard not to do well over here. So I was there for a while and then, um, and came back and was with Pete Russell in Cheltenham mm-hmm. and he kind of molded the next five years of my tennis. And I got to number two in great Britain for singles, um, 199 in the world. Yeah. But then we're still, I was ten thousand pounds in debt. Wow. So you think when you're young, if I'm two in the country and I'm top two hundred in the world, I'm going to be making money, and I wasn't. So it became a big um, turning point for me at Edgebaston, the WTA tournament there mm-hmm. in the summer. I was up against a good friend, Mel South, yep. who was a very young British junior at the time. We both got wild cards. And I based, we both knew that whoever won that match would likely get a singles wild card into Wimbledon. And I knew that if I got into Wimbledon, it would pay off my debts and it would pay me about five thousand yeah. pounds to kind of start again. And if I didn't win that match, I figured it was probably time to switch and do something else. The match was terrible because we were both so nervous. <laughs> won the match, got into Wimbledon, won a round, so I had the money to kind of continue on with my tennis and that's when I started thinking maybe I should turn into a doubles specialist there was kind of an opening before we touch on doubles what on earth is it like to win a round at Wimbledon um it it was amazing like I still I need to look over the videos (laughs) it's just I was a set up and kind of a break up and then started getting very nervous and I remember my brother It's in a newspaper article where I had to actually tell him to kind of be quiet because he, (laughs) 
he was so desperate for me to win. He was going, come on. But I could hear it in his voice each time. It would just go yeah. up into the octave each time. So at the change of heads, I was like, Shh, just c- calm down. And, and then, so winning it was just, it was incredible. Oh. It, it's, but it's something now, it's like in a different lifetime yeah. now. It's kind of, because you don't, I don't talk about my pro career that often because you feel, well, you feel like a bit of a name dropper if you're like, yeah, oh, I was I on the pro tour. So it's it's something that I actually don't really discuss that often with people. But it was more for the what made me proud is the fact that my mum and dad and my nana and my sister and brother were there to kind of enjoy it and be yeah. like, oh, that's my sister, that's yeah. our daughter. Oh, impressed. They must be proud as punch. I can only but imagine. Be fantastic. Yeah. It's a good day. So um, you then talked about you went into doubles, which is interesting because the, the last podcast that we've just put out with uh, with Sophie Cockrell, she uh, doubles player and spoke passionately about her, her love of doubles. Uh, so tell us about uh, your, your life as a doubles player. Um, I guess it changed everything because before I was struggling to make money yeah. and I was, I was playing the qualifying of Grand Slams, um, but... The uh, the biggest part of my year was the grass court season, and it wasn't until and it's the circus that surrounds it yeah. with wild cards and media, and it wasn't until I actually got to the next level where I realised it was actually just another group of tournaments, and every other international player just saw it as another part of the schedule, mm-hmm. and that kind of started helping me. But the the decisions going to doubles was well, it it changed my life. It helped me then represent my country in fed cup i got a bronze medal in the commonwealth games played every grand slam so it 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 was it was life-changing it 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 allowed me to play every elite tournament from miami to indian wells and it got me the opportunity to work with louis kaye who works with jamie murray and is the best double specialist coach possibly the best skill development coach in the world. He, he changed my life with just how to kind of understand the game of tennis, but also how to coach and develop players and just do it, well, in a, such a basic way. But as long as you're communicating in a mm. positive manner, making them work hard and think. And so how, how does that translate into like your children. coaching? Sorry, how does that translate into your coaching now from what you got from uh, your training as a doubles player? Um, he Well, luckily when I was... Um, training at the NTC with mm. Louis, there was um, a young junior called Ruth Seaborn who mm. was 15, and I remember watching her and thinking, "Gosh, she could be really good. Like, moves well, really athletic, technically very good, but kind of like most juniors, kind of wasn't fully dedicating a time yeah. to it." And so I took her under my wing and I said, "Look, I, come and train with me." because I needed people to train with it's you mm. think it's easy to find people but you really can't find people to train with so I was like come and train with me at the NTC be on court with Louis Kaye and then Louis kind of spent those two three years with me communicating to me how to teach yep. Ruth and to develop her and he kind of gives you a blueprint where if you work off it well this is how I yep. see it now anyway if you work from it like with rotation movement beating the bounce and you just you give them a really good foundation to work off then anything's possible yeah. so Ruth went on to incredible things in American University she's now an assistant coach in America so she's someone that I'm very proud of and it was because of Louis who I could actually help mentor Ruth in order to kind of succeed yeah. so so today we're going to kind of explore pathways through tennis and you've already said with with Ruth there's a great example of where it's taken her to not just the experience of playing but now as being an assistant coach um just before we quickly jump onto that i'd be really interested to know um how has your pathway through tennis shaped how you then shaped tennis smarts well the way i kind of viewed it is that i was written off at a very young age i wasn't Mm. talent id'd i what wasn't i guess i was athletic but i wasn't particularly fast around the court I worked hard, I was incredibly determined, but I wasn't a top junior. I wasn't yeah. funded by the LTA. Wasn't well, I wasn't given anything really, which I think is the reason why I actually was successful because I didn't have any of the stress that my friends mm. who were rover players at the time 
had on them. Like as soon as you were a Rover player, so like a, a sponsored LTA player, everyone wanted to beat you yeah. and you were going on trips and it was incredibly stressful. So that kind of helped me find the right pathway to me for me just because I was kind of ignored. Yeah. And and I got to the point where I thought, well, if someone from Middlesbrough who was ignored and wasn't a particularly good junior who was in full time education, went to school, <laughs> went to do A levels, had a social life, had yeah. a normal upbringing. If I can play every Grand Slam, represent my country, yeah. because I found the right pathway, then surely there's others who can, if well, emulate me, or if not, at least stay in tennis and find other avenues, yeah. like being a college coach, or there's players on the Pro Two and now from college who are doing great, just to keep them in the sport, because it is such a good sport hmm. for your longevity and going into a different career. I mean, I, for me as parent, I, I and I, I'm looking into the industry. I don't know how you can talent ID so young. Um, I, I, so I look at my boy and I think he's going to grow another foot and a half minimum. And so his serve, which I wouldn't say is dynamite now, is going to get slightly better uh, if he gets any, anywhere near his mum and dad's height. And that's yeah. what his coach is already talking about. And uh, yeah. and, and so how can you talent ID? before for some of these youngsters before puberty before growth spurt happens before all it and then you write off which just seems ridiculous a whole court of young people who they may be developing a little bit slower or would grow differently yeah H how does an organization like the lta say well you at an early age you're the lot we presume will make it and the rest i don't know how yeah. that happens i know i never understood it myself <clears throat> either to be honest because at the end of the day you can have loads of talent yep get given everything and actually not work particularly hard and yep. not have the mentality so instead of looking at those who maybe can run i don't know what i don't even know what they do now with it but who uh, you think at that moment in time are talented if they don't have the right attributes in work ethic mm. then there's kind of they're not going to get no. much further no. so it always i remember when i in 2010 i presented to the lta with tennis smart because mm -hmm. i wanted to I, I wanted to offer it to them first and say, look, this is something that we can incorporate in the whole of the country and just making it very clear to the juniors and to the parents who are stressed and worried about the financial implications. If you can say to them, look, we've got 4,000 kids coming through Talent ID. We're giving 360 letters. It was Matrix at the time yeah. of saying, congratulations, you've been chosen. If you're not getting a letter that you've been chosen, majority will think, well, what's the point? Yep. Like, it costs a fortune. <clears throat> I may as well go and play football or do something else. Yep. So I said, look, give a letter to those ones and say, congratulations, you've been chosen for the college pathway, I thought at the time. Mm -hmm. but it, And we help them then go down the British University yep. route or the American University. Or just if they have a passion to be tennis coaches, yep. then they stay in the tennis industry. But... That was 2010, so didn't work out. No, but it would be nice to have different yeah. pathways. Because look, looking in uh, as I and my wife do, kind of particularly from a, a youth work background, particularly looking at kind of child and adolescent development, everybody grows, everybody matures at different levels. There is just the the breadth of learning styles that is vastly different, and with such a small cohort. You, you do become selectively biased that you like a child to be at this point at this stage in their life. But yet, I remember, I just remember hearing the reading Judy Murray's book and she talked about how she thought Andy uh, then progressed a bit above Jimmy because she, he was behind him all the time. He always mm -hmm. had, she, he was always pursuing his older brother. Uh, and the the fear I get, the fear over again, but the, the, the concern I have for those who get talent ID at such a young age, as you've said, they're always a target to knock off. And particularly when in your young teens, you are still trying to form your own personal ID, uh, whilst people are then trying to, in a sporting context, knock you off your perch, when all of the time you're trying to affirm yourself and discover yeah. who you are. That doesn't feel like the most healthiest dynamic with which to grow up as a child, let alone sport prodigy and you probably get labeled yeah. so it's always been a, a concern of mine so with with kind of pathways if we and excuse clunky language here 
Uh, but if we looked at, say, for example, a more recreational player, I don't know how you define that, uh, but a recreational player, someone who loves their sport but isn't dreaming of being the next Conta. Um, because one of my concerns on Pathways is we can only we, we may just focus on those who want to be the next Conta, but there are others in the sport for whom the sport is of great advantage and benefit to and helps there. What do you notice about sport, maybe around character, formation, skill set, development, for those who are more the recreational player, that tennis as a sport helps them into a pathway into maybe other aspects. They may not go anywhere near the sport as, a, as an employment, but tennis itself is a great um, training platform for other things. Well, for me, I was quite shy, which mm. shocks a lot of people, but I, at a young age, I, I, well, I didn't like competing. I was scared yeah. of that. I, I wasn't, I didn't have loads of friends. I had like my group of friends and everything. And so I was probably a typical girl at 15 who was struggling with being on the court on my own in yeah. front of everyone, which I'd much rather played football where you can kind of be in a team, team sport. Um, <laughs> so I think for tennis, it, well, it's, it's, it changed my life. Thank, thankfully I stayed in, I, I almost, quit at 14 yeah um and i remember telling my mum and dad and i said right you've got that's fine you can do whatever you like but you've got to tell nigel my coach yeah. the next day and i was too scared to tell nigel that i wanted to quit so thankfully i was scared of him at that time and i continued on but it it's taken me around the world i've met yeah. so many incredible people i have my own company company now because of it so it's and it's just a great way of well, for many as well, staying out of trouble. Mm. Like I, I remember driving to Tennis World each night to go and play tennis, and you'd see just groups of kids hanging around the shops, which yep. you see all over the country, just because, well, they probably didn't have anything else to do. And so sport actually does keep you out of trouble, yep. and it Great. allows you to meet other people. And and that's why it's the, that's the main thing really for Tennis Smart, is just keeping kids in the sport giving a support system to the parents so they understand exactly what to expect, not saying, if you get to this level, maybe you can have this, just very, giving them very clear goals yeah. that everyone can reach. And then when you're ticking off these goals and you're being successful, you then think, oh, actually, this is enjoyable. I'm actually getting somewhere with yeah. it instead of just kind of losing every weekend and and not kind of having much of a life. So. Yeah that's kind of the thinking that everyone every player in the UK can go down not the pro pathway that's less than one percent can do that but the other three pathways the British University route yep. is incredible and it's getting better every day the American University route is open to all levels I have a player who well I had a player who's a 10.1 rating back in the day who came out here and had a She's just graduating. She's loved it. And then if you don't want to go to university, which is fine, you, nowadays a lot of people are getting degrees, so you, mm. going down a different route is also very important if you don't particularly want to go to school. And But you're passionate about being a tennis coach or maybe managing yep. a tennis centre, then we have that route for players as well. Super. So just keeping people's options open, yep. basically. So when you get to 18 after your A-levels you can choose and you're not just making a decision based on fear or stress yeah so it's uh, just to come back on something you said so you were talking about the u.s uh system being open to all levels which by intimation means the uk one isn't or is it no that that one is too uh, the nice thing about the uk is that each university has more than one team oh, okay so but there's just not as many teams yeah. so in america there's a thousand or so <laughs> teams but if you're a lower level, you're not going to hear from a Division mm. One university, yeah. but you might hear from a lot of good Division Threes, yeah. which tend to be very, very academic, and where the level, so the level can go from top twenty junior in the world for girls, yeah, all the way down to someone who really doesn't compete that often, but just loves being on a tennis team with their friends, and they use it to just get themselves out to America. So there's yeah. every kind of level you can imagine. And also that level, that's going to be uh, people who may, may not be aspiring to get into the pro or any any of that kind of uh, level, 
but me constantly playing tennis is the added value of why I got this university. It's helping me with my studies. Uh, it's all those kind of the knock on added benefit that sport gives. Uh, it may give help a focus of mind for studies because I'm burning off my energy during the day. And it's, it's, it's a social group that I get to connect with. So it's a really healthy way to do uni. Yeah, like if you're coming over to America, it's a massive transition. It's incredibly yeah. scary leaving home for the first, well, for many, for me, it was for the first time. But instead of having to go and try and find friends in various groups, you immediately yeah. have seven friends <clears throat> on the team who have to like you and help you <laughs> and make sure that you're okay. Yeah. And then you go through tough battles with them on the tennis court. So that automatically brings you quite close. Mm. So for someone like me, who's quite shy to go in and walk into a team where they were going to look after me immediately, it yeah. helped me kind of cope. Um, and then you look at now with all the, the companies, everyone, everyone gets told you have to go to university. You've got to get a degree, even when going into a trade or being yep. a mechanic or a plumber is, well, it makes far more money these days anyway. It makes far more sense. Yep. But if you do want to go that route, companies are now looking at student athletes because they know everyone has a degree these days. Mm. So instead of just looking at students, they want to hire athletes because they know that you've had to take commands from yep. two coaches for four years. You have had to be on time. You've got a great work ethic. You can handle stress. You're determined. So you're kind of already ahead of the game by being a student athlete, knowing that you've had to balance so many different things. And that, and that, so, for, that for me, sorry, is really, really encouraging because when I watch our son play and all the rest of the, the, uh, the young athletes playing, they are, they're turning up with a few aches and pains. They're still pushing through it. The, the shot select, it's not quite working. I'm having to really work on this side of my game. Uh, I'm, I'm losing a lot because that's the joy of what tennis often does for you. Even in the match that I win, I'm going to lose points. And then for me, if I then spun that around thought of an employer uh, and I'm looking at someone who has had a significant journey in a sport that has demanded and pushed their resilience levels, not just they're really clever with a, with a ball and a racket, but the sport demands something about the person's character, then that very logically will impress me as, as an employee. Yeah, uh, I, I watch, <laughs> yeah, whichever. Whichever, who cares? <laughs> Whenever I watch my players who come out at 17, 18 to America yeah. and you see what one year in America does, because there are demands on, like, university in the UK, you don't have to go to class if you don't want to. No one cares. I won't it's tell my son you. that. Yeah. <laughs> but in, in America, you've got to go. If, yeah. if you're not going, the coach is going to find out and then you're going to get, well, you're probably, the, the team will be running, like, doing fitness because of you or maybe you can't play so there's yeah. there's all of those rules that you have to follow so that's why i think it's important just and to have another outlet as yeah. well just you've got to do other things and have different options and stuff because you never know what you might want to do when you get older yeah so, so what is the relationship between the college uh, and the player because it's i've heard and this is again my ignorance and trying to decipher in-house conversation it's almost like the player is there technically their employee is because they can't then play tennis and be paid for it you really are hours so that seems like a, a, a dynamic i'm not aware of yeah i know that much about and that's something that kind of it was difficult for me coming over and for most british players because although i wasn't friends with nigel yeah i was i still went like it was a different relationship like yes he was my coach but we would still kind of hang out in the social things that went on at Tennis World. When you get to America, there's a very clear line between coach and player. Right. The coach is your boss. So you won't, you won't ever be going out to the same places and kind of seeing them, even though you're maybe 20, 21. There's a very clear line, and whatever the coach says, that's what you've got to do. Okay. And yes, they might have a back-and-forth communication-wise, but the end of the day it's the coach's decision and 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 you learn quite quickly that if you're on time you're late so everyone yeah. changes their watches over here you've got to be 10 minutes early and and that's something that gets instilled into you so when you do come back to the UK and you view the players who are in America who are at tournaments they're able they're very good at 
being off court, having fun, socializing. But as soon as they step on court, then mm. that's that they know that's when the business end starts yeah. and they become very, um, well, kind of what's the word focused, focused on what they're yeah. doing. So there's a good way of kind of understanding being able to go off court, having fun, yeah. enjoy yourself, walk on court, and then it becomes serious. Which is what was really impressive, and I guess it caught the British public's imagination with Cam Norrie when he suddenly appeared in the Davis Cup tie here in Spain. Was it uh, uh, Vilas Roma? Oh, and it, I can't remember who he beat, but he beat him with two sets down. Uh, and there was a couple of little uh, interviews and stuff about how did you find the crowd? And he, he can't just throw it off played in front of bigger crowds. And <laughs> and it's like, yeah, this isn't much. He should come to America. Uh, and there was, he is a young man, first time representing Great Britain, big stage on clay against the Spanish. You couldn't, you couldn't wait any more against him. It was stuff like I'd never really played on clay before. <laughs> and he just walks on the court, goes down two sets, and then he's like, game on. And you're like, wow, where have you been coached? Amazing yeah. resilience. When you he was at TCU, who yeah. has a brilliant coach, an amazing setup. <clears throat> the the school is great because they get a lot of fans. So yeah, he'll yeah. be playing in front of fans. But if you're going into the likes of LSU, Tennessee, you have fans there who are kind of hurling abuse at you. So yeah. Yeah. you kind of get used to, it. and it's fun because you're playing in front of a crowd who don't really want you to win. So no. that Davis Cup crowd, he he would have thrived and loved it, yeah. and and that's what's nice. And we and that's what we were kind of we were in need of. There's there's so many stats showing that college is a great pathway mm -hmm. to the majority, and there's lots on the pro tour. Kevin Anderson, John Isner, who were doing really well. But because it weren't British, it was still hard for people in the UK to think it was a viable pathway mm. to going pro. So to have someone, Cameron Norrie, where they can actually maybe get to see him and watch him play and think, actually, I can probably do what he's doing. Yep. It, it's exactly what we need. And we've got some really good women coming through. Eden Richardson's doing amazing at LSU. Lauren John-Baptiste. So we're now sending the very elite... Well, just under the the elite, the, there's ob the obvious ones who should go pro. We know that they're ready yeah. and they can transition on and they've got funding. But the group just below it, like a Sasha Hill, mm. we've, she's going to come out and go to Florida State. She's going to be perfect in four years' time when she then wants to, if she still wants to go pro, she's going to have everything that she needs to do there. And so the college system, again, is this is, is like an incubator of... Uh, it, it almost seems like those who go uh, are able to go pro a little bit younger. That was their time, or they're, they're having a go, whether it's their time or not. I guess results will show. But my personality says I want to do it now. Another person says I want to. In a few years' time, I'll be ready. So this is again going back to kind of the whole talent ID of all were talented. One had either the competency set or the confidence to go a little earlier, and the other one just needed a little bit more maturing through what sounds like a really robust maturing process. And I wonder whether those who come out of the collegiate system in themselves might be a better player than if they'd not gone through it. Well, obviously, logically, they would. But it'd be interesting to see tracking the longevity of their pro professional career having come out of the US compared to those who maybe started really younger. Well, I'll tell know. you the stat from when I was... When I came out... Um, I was coming out of probably one of the best year groups for juniors. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the players were the best in uh, ITF juniors, and then they were getting WTA rankings quite yeah. quickly, like top 250. When I went out to university at 18 and I graduated at 22, none of my year group were playing. Wow. They'd all quit. Wow. And you think, that is terrible. Yeah. How can that happen? It happens every single year because when you go on the tour at 18, it's even harder now with the transition tour. When you go on the tour at 18, if you don't have the money yep. to back you to get through those lower levels, then you're not going to break through. So what... The stats for the past, they don't work now with the new tour, but everyone was saying if you don't make top 300 for the women within a year, you're going to get stuck in the lower level and you can't get out. Because no. emotionally, it just, it's soul-destroying when you're losing majority of the time. Mentally, it's hard. You're making zero money. It's costing yeah. a fortune. 
And if you're doing that at 18, that's very difficult. So I thought, God, top 300, that's, that's pretty quick. Like, and so I checked to see if I did it. And I, I think I got to within a year, I'd got to like 340. Mm-hmm. So I'd actually, because I'd had four years of training and matches, yep. match after match after match and support. And I didn't have to worry about money in America. Everything was paid for. I jumped, I leapfrogged those lower levels a lot quicker than someone who was at 18 and trying to battle through. Yeah. So that's why I just, for me, America is a no brainer. And if you're one of the elite players, you now can just go for a year or even a semester. Let's say you go to Vanderbilt, who mm-hmm. are probably one of the best developmental universities in the country for women. Uh, Astra Sharma just made final of mixed doubles at Australian yep. Open, progressed through qualifying. She's a perfect example of just giving yourself time. And so it's kind of, if you can just give yourself an option of getting out here, seeing what's on offer, stay for a semester. If you win nationals, you beat everyone, you feel that the level is too easy. I've not seen it happen yet, but if you feel <laughs> the level is too easy, then say to my coach, look, I'm actually, I've just won nationals. Like the matches aren't good enough. They will then say, we get it. Yep. Go pro. Irina Falcone <clears throat> went pro after two years, went to top hundred very quickly. And, and then you, they'll then say to you, okay, when you finished on the tour and you're ready to come back and do your degree, we'll pay for it. Wow. So if you're going to come out and go and play at Vanderbilt for a year, everything paid for, you do really well, go pro for 10 years and then be able to come back and get a yep. Vanderbilt degree, which is one of the best in the world. It's, Sounds a no brainer, isn't it? It's, yeah. And so I always, I always wonder why players are still not at least utilizing the fact mm. that you can come on visits out here. Cause it is, it's a big, it's a major decision. I get it. And I know the, the elite British players have people saying, Oh, don't go to college. They've not produced anyone stay here which is fine, but if you're not willing to fund that player until they get to the top 100, then you've got to be very careful with what you're telling them because it costs 70 to 100 grand a year if you're going to do it Mm. right. Um, So I I just wish more players, just keep it quiet. Don't, you don't have to tell anyone what your thought process is as a junior, but come out to America, go on visits. They're all free. See what it's like at a Vanderbilt, at a Stanford, at a Florida State. And if that doesn't wow you and you think that's not the right fit, that's fine. Yeah. But at least you know, and you're not coming back t- to me or someone else at 19, 20, having been on the tour for two years, realizing it's incredibly difficult yeah. and saying, I want to go to university now. Like I, all I want for people, you don't have to come out to America, but at least just look at all of your options. Yeah. So when you do the, make the decision, <clears throat> then it's probably the right one. Yeah. Because my my couple of reflections on what you've just said there is the sheer cost of getting a player to that next level. And I sit there as the Royal Bank of Dad going, you know, if my boy ever got anywhere near, uh, and I certainly don't do this podcast because I think he is the next Andy or anything like that. But if you've got, you know, well, sorry, mate, doors are now shut. Dad can't afford to get you there. That's it. Dream's over. Um, uh, And so this is a very viable way an opportunity. My other bit was I, I got really interested in the fact that you talked about uh, you need to get in the top 300 quite quick. My 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 head just went to that would probably mean if I was that player, I might. I wonder whether do I stint my development in um, technique and stuff because I'll do anything just to win the match to get into the top 300. Uh, Tell I me I'm wrong. It's perfectly fine. I'm no coach. No, no, <laughs> it, it, no. It it, may, it kind of makes sense. So basically, when I went to America. Because Nigel was such a great coach, technically I had a great foundation to yeah. work off. Good forehand, good serve. I still can't hit a backhand, but I could at least slice. Yeah. And so I had, and I could volley. So I had all the tools I needed. I just couldn't cope with the matches. Mm. My emotion, emotional yeah. kind of state and mentality hadn't caught up with my game. And so what America gave me. My coach, Jen Hyde, she's a Florida State coach now, but I was at University of Houston. We we weren't on court all the time doing Mm. technical stuff because I didn't need it, but she gave me the support and the guidance I needed at that time. So 
for me, I needed a lot of matches, match after match after match in incredibly stressful situations, which I learned to deal with. So when I did get on the tour at 22, I, I remember going back to the UK and it was for the grass court season and it was for the playoff uh, for Wimbledon. And I remember going there with so much confidence because I had been eight in college tennis mm. and I just thought I could beat anyone. And I wanted to prove the LTA wrong that, I am good and I'm I'm going to show you. And I I think I lost to Julie Pullen in the final. I did I I can't even remember. I did well. And a lot of people are like, "Oh, wow, Sarah, who's this Sarah girl? Like she yeah. just came back from university." And so university gave me the confidence and the matches and that's yeah. I think what Cameron Norrie has gained from it. I think Dan Kane and at Soto did a really good blog showing the amount of matches Cameron Norrie had had mm -hmm. compared to someone in his who was wasn't in college, and so Cameron played in the Christmas. You get a month off at Christmas, you get three months off in the summer, so you play all of the time then the pro events. But then you get all of your matches in college, yeah. so he was playing like triple the amount of matches you would normally get. So if you're winning every week, if you're losing every single week as an 18 year old you're getting one match a week yeah and so you can't you just can't improve with that and then you start questioning it well even at 25 i remember being in mexico and i'd lost to i lost to christina fazano who was actually a college player as well in singles and i shouldn't really have lost and i lost and i'm in the middle of mexico in this small town in this valley which is boiling hot and the it was the guys when they do the restringing, they didn't even have a restringing machine. He just pulled the string. That's the <laughs> level of tournament it was. And you just sat there going, what am I doing with my life? Like, yeah. But at least I had a degree to back it up. So it wasn't True. so worrying. But that's what these kids go through at 18, where you're, you're in Vietnam, you're in India, you're in Nigeria. The, some of the places you go to are quite dangerous in order to pick up points. And to have to actually figure out how to survive and deal with that is is yeah. very difficult for someone who isn't getting the funding that they need in order to do it properly yeah. so how, how does um how does tennis smart work then with british player do they have to be british that's one question and then connecting them to the right college experience or level or however you frame that to make the right matching process how does tennis yeah, so smart work so in 2005, I helped build the LTA program, yep. college program. I worked with Paul Hutchins and we made sure that it was set up and there was something there for people. And while I was on the tour, I was helping players for free and I was mm -hmm. enjoying it more than competing. And that turned into Tennis Smart in 2010, where we were the first and I think kind of still only company who only look after British tennis players. Right, yeah. Now, if there's a German player who's at Soto Tennis Academy doing British schooling, we'll help them. Okay. But my mindset was I wanted to stop the 50% dropout rate. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that we gave parents peace of mind where, yes, you're plowing in all of this money to your child and the tennis, but it is can be rewarding. Mm -hmm. Look, we've got these great pathways. So I only... Tennis Smart is really set up for British tennis players yeah. and it's to stop the 50% dropout rate. And what we do, and for years I've been going around the country giving presentations and we talk to players as young as eight years old with their parents and we present about what's out there. Yes, we all want to be like Andy Murray or Johanna Conta, but the likelihood is that of that is quite low at a young age. So It's even, it's even lower for me now. It's, uh, yeah, it's even though it's gone yeah, for me, I think. Yeah. Those palmos, I think. It's, it's, <laughs> it's too many palmos and Greg <laughs> visiting Greg's. Sorry, I interrupted. Exactly, yeah, my dad does loves Greg's as well. Oh. Um, but yeah, so we're kind of just like, okay, how can I give as much information as possible and support and honesty? Mm. I'm not. If someone says I want to go to UCLA, yeah, and they're not the level, I'm going to be brutally honest yeah. and go, listen, you're not that level, but. You could go to University of Montana, which is a really good setup. You're going to enjoy it. So we just make it very clear to what's available, what's attainable, the yep. kind of work ethic you need to have, the fitness, the tournament schedule so you can improve your ranking or rating. 
And then once we get them through that junior tennis part and just act as kind of a support system, the most important part is the placement and just making sure we find the right coach for them. Coaching style, incredibly important. Are you going to make the team? Where are you going to play on it? Does the schedule allow you to win matches or is it so hard that you're really going to struggle? Because then that's pointless as well. Um, Does it have your degree? What are the locations like? The internship opportunities? So we look at every single area. So right now with my players who still have to be placed, we're on WhatsApp all the time talking about, okay, well, we really like this one. We like this coach, but not sure about the internship opportunities transfer when you transition out and then once they're there we look after them um because the parents are worried and stressed and the players you're going to go up through ups and downs it's university in america so it's like a roller coaster so i'll be there as an agony aunt and if you need me to chat to the coach or if the coach wants to chat to me i always try and i work with both the coaches trust me because i'm married to a college coach so i know the stress there under so I'll yeah. always be incredibly supportive but I'll also be supportive of my player and once they get to senior year we help them transition either into a career so we turn into a recruitment company or I have eight players on the pro tour now who are doing well we help them transition to the pro tour Amazing. so we try and do everything really which and I love love it but it's it's still amazing how you'll give presentations even now and it, everything's on social media but there's still people who weren't aware of this pathway yep. and didn't realize that yes i'm a 6.1 lta rating but i can actually get myself yep. out to america if i want to so speaking on ratings so um I've become aware of UTR, which I understand isn't a medical condition. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, and uh, to coin a good northeastern tea sad phrase, what the chuff is UTR? <laughs> um, uh, here's where I'm at. I understood it existed. I understood that players probably needed to be regged on it. So as uh, as Kath was out one evening, I was bored. I thought, well, let's just put our Elijah on it. So I gave him a profile and then he go, and now what mystically or magically happens? Uh, he's currently playing in a tournament that has a UTR badge on it. And I, uh, oh, I am gloriously confused uh, as to what it is and how it functions. Well, it's kind of, I think the, well, the way the <laughs> LTA setup is right now with the ratings yeah. and rankings, which... In my day, they were all right, but they've changed it so many times that they're incredibly inaccurate. So there was a tournament back in June where, for the men, every single man was a 1.1 rating. Right. Which, there's no way all of them were the same level. And so (laughs) when you then look at their UTRs, they were all completely different levels. And then there was some of the very top college players who obviously didn't have an LTA rating, but were probably would have been number one seed if yep. they'd used the UTRs, couldn't get into the event. So how does so, UTR give you a score? So it's tricky. So it came about like six, seven years ago in America. The best thing the LTA have ever done is that they started sending in their results for all the LTA yep. tournaments before any other federation. I think Tennis Canada were pretty quick as well so for the last three years the british utrs have been pretty accurate now the whole point of the system is they want players to compete on a regular basis and they want it to be level based instead of turning up for a tournament where your first round you beat someone love and love and it's easy and then you get killed love and love by the number one seed which does tend to happen quite a lot wait there's no development going on there whatsoever so these tournaments are great where they know that if you're a 10.5 UTR and I'm a 10.5 UTR, we're going to have a very close match. Yeah. Barry Fulcher has been incredible and he's running the Progress Tour. Yeah. So there's actually a tour of UTR events going through the UK okay. right now. The very first one they did in Brighton, I think they had a 12-year-old girl play a 70-year-old man. Same right. UTRs. And it was like a three-set 
two hour match. <laughs> And it, <laughs> That's great. It was incredible. So what's great for the girls is that instead of having tournaments which sometimes have to be cancelled or the yep. draws are just there's not as many girls playing, the girls play the boys because as long as you're yep. the same UTR, it's going to be a challenging match. <clears throat> so it means that all draws are going to be full and the girls get to compete. Yep. Now, no one is being told the algorithm. So unlike the LTA system... And the ITF ranking system, you yep. can't really cheat the system. The ITF ranking, if you're very rich and you travel all over the world yep. playing tournaments, you can get to quite a high standard without being exceptional. Yep. The LTA, uh, the UTR now will actually show you, not your true level, all systems have faults, mm. yep. but this is probably the easiest one just to cross match. If I have someone who's playing someone who's French, then now we kind of know the level of mm. a little bit better. The great thing for college coaches is they can kind of, their, if you go on universaltennis.com, their whole team, so University of Maryland's team, all of their UTRs are on it. Right. So now when I have a player who maybe is a lower level who says, I want to play for Stanford, before trying to explain to them why it wasn't possible, it was difficult. Now I can say, <laughs> well, let's go on UTR. You'll see that they're number six in the 11.5 UTR and you're at eight. So yeah. this isn't going to work. So it's just, it's nice because it's, it's transparent. Like it, you can see actually what your goals are and what you need to do. Yeah. And that, That's it in a nutshell. I love the whole analogy of the 12, it was 12 year old girl playing this, the 70 year old. Because let's face it, the 70 year old being very wily, very caught well, sure, and the learning for, for that, for the young girl will be. Uh, will be immense in the set. How, yeah. I'm not, how am I not beating this? Seven, well, how does he get to that with the little tricks and flicks that are happening? And the learning is a completely different style to play against. Yeah, and that's how I grew up. I, well, with just with Tennis World, like if you could kind of package Tennis World up yeah. and put it in different parts of the country. I know Judy Murray would go on about it as well. And down in Brighton, they had a lot of clubs like this where it was social. Boys played girls. Yep. We had match play all the time. But I would also have to play the adults and i remember mm -hmm. playing julie ray at tennis world who would slice and dice <laughs> and trying to understand how to play yeah. someone like that when you're just a someone who hits it as hard as she can um it's great for them and it's i love it for the boys because the stress that it puts the boys under knowing yeah. that they have to play a girl yeah they don't like it, but it's they're going to soon realize that actually you, you're going to develop because you're able to deal with this stress of, oh, I don't want to lose to a girl, and you're going to get better because of it. So yeah. I, I hope more and more people kind of buy into the system and play more of the UTR events that Barry's hosting because yeah. the atmosphere is a lot nicer. People aren't worried about their rating moving up because they know it moves all the time if you compete. So then, because logically now with with our son out here, they they sent him to one or two tournaments to kind of almost find his tormenting, tournamenting level, I guess. And so he played for his age group and they said he, he's, he's a bit better than the average age, so let's just move him up an age level. Uh, and then he, which is where he's a bit more comfortable at. But then the other week, oh, uh, no, back end of last year, none of his age group turned up. So they just put him into the under 14s, under 15s. And these lads were enormous. But yet he beat one of them. And it was kind of like, well... Age isn't the indicator of level. Um, it did his ego a lot of good beating this guy we thought was Goliath, but um, <laughs> but the, you know he's played matches in the past where he's won the six loves and six. Well, I know it's good for his ego as he walks off thinking he is at the next Andy Murray. But mate, you weren't you weren't tested deep down. You know you weren't, and that match wasn't a developmental moment for you. And so yeah. if we that something like UTR will really I guess help with that process. Yeah, I I think so, and it just. Before people were would play up a level, yep. so a lot of my players would be like, "Oh, I'm going to play futures," and I'd be like, "But why?" Oh, because I'll play good players. I'm like, "But you're probably not going to win." So yeah. when you're scheduling, if you want to be recruited or be recruitable, the way you schedule your tournaments is that you need a lot of tournaments where you can go deep into them. So you go yep. into the semis, go into the finals, and then reward yourself with the futures where you know. You might win one round, but you're not going to yep. go any further. But people would play up thinking whether it was a safety mechanism as well because you're not meant to win. I probably would have chosen to play up because I'd be like, well, I'm not meant to win. Like, there's no pressure. 
But by putting yourself under pressure of playing people your level week in, week out, yeah. then again, you're going to develop. So the UTR events are nice as well, where I, I think if we can get to a point, and this is what I know Barry's trying to do, but we need support on it. If we can get to a point where every region has a UTR event every mm. weekend where no family has to travel further than an hour if they don't want to then you're going to yeah. have people having access to tournaments on a regular basis and us poor northerners don't yep. always have to drive down south to get a tournament which and you'll get the parent vote on that we'll all be very happy exactly so if if that's what it comes to and it, it can because it's level based and boys and girls play men yep. and women play then you can have a tournament all yeah. the time and it's going to be full and it's going to be challenging and then it cuts down the costs of these yeah well the parents who have to pay all this money now i, I don't know how my mum and dad did it no. back in the day but and it's more expensive it, it was interesting just thinking on the the parental cost because i just want to ask a question about what do you see the parents role in, in pathways is in the latest tennis head uh, magazine uh there's a bit on uh uh nomi osaka and there's a, there's a, there's, they've highlighted a, a statement about her mum getting up at 4 a.m. Da, 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 to do all this. And in one level, you're like, wow, what a dedicated mum. And the other part, you're like, wow, really? Uh, and she's very unique. It's not like uh, my wife now has to get up at 4 a.m. and that's what that's going to make the click for Elijah. But the amount of cash, the amount of investment, and part of you suddenly thinks, how healthy is this for mum and dad? Uh, how healthy is this for mum and dad relationship with, with child? Because... Even if you're saying, just go have fun, you are very aware that dad looks haggard because he's done an extra shift or mum's doing this because to buy that racket um, and all the rest of it. And so there is a there is an unhealthy dynamic, almost it seems, to enable kids to get to the top. So what do you see as us as the parents, the enthusiastic creatures we are, um, uh, sat courtside, what do you think is our role in the journey that's of a pathway, say, if they do come across the States or use the college system in the UK? What, what's our function in that? What's our role? I, I think as a parent, you have to sit down as a family and just say, OK, these are our routes through. These are our pathways. Mm. Are we capable of going pro? Do we have £70,000 in the bank for each year? You're not in the top 100. Yeah. No. So... Let's we'll keep that one as a idea, maybe for when yeah. you're older, but and that's maybe your dream. So let's find ways to get to that pathway. And we'll look at American University. Okay, what do I need academically to be eligible? What mm -hmm. do I need for America? What level do I need for tennis in order it to be a full ride or for it at least to be cheaper than a British university? So can I ask on the cheaper bit? I I'd heard that the girls are getting full scholarships but the boys don't or is that uh, just a rumor i don't know no that it's true so there's um there's a thing called title nine over here right. where it's equality for men and women and the american football <clears throat> team take up a hundred full scholarships every year right which mean men's soccer golf and tennis they're the main ones that get mm -hmm. impacted so a lot of well, probably about 150 Division One women's teams will have eight full scholarships. Right. After 150, there'll be partial scholarships. It won't be a fully yeah. funded program. So it'll it'll run in the same way as a Division Two will. Yeah. So if you're the level of an eight UTR or higher, then your likelihood of getting a full scholarship is quite high where everything is paid for. Mm -hmm. All you pay for is a parent is the flight over there and travel insurance yeah. for boys i actually prefer the system because it opens up more opportunities for okay. you every, so? team, every team has four and a half scholarships so you've got eight to ten players on the team the coach has four and a half athletic scholarships to divide between them if you're top three on the team you're going to get more athletic money yeah then if you're bottom three if academically you're very, very good, you did great at GCSEs, you did well in the entrance exam, you're going to get a good chunk of academic money. Ah. So as a girl coming in as a late developer, like I was, even if I had the potential to do well and play at UCLA, which by my junior year I could have, but because I wasn't that level and they could only offer me a full scholarship, they're not going to look at me. Mm -hmm. 
for a boy who was like me, a late developer, who maybe he's six foot two, technically he's good, he moves well, has a good attitude. We can tell in a year or two he's going to be good. The coach can say, look, academically you did great. We can give you a lot of money. Tennis-wise, you're going to be six, seven on the team. Right. So we can't, can't give you much <laughs> athletic money your first year, but because you have a budget, which would work because we're going to give you academic money, we're going to bring you in the team. Now, when you do well, because we believe in you and we know you're going to be good, and you play number four the second year, we're going to give you more athletic money. So ah, okay. Yeah. Then he's going to be number two, and then he's going to be number one, where by – by his fourth year, if he's number one, he might be on a full ride. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So that so that's why I prefer it for boys. Where yes, you have to pay, but it opens up more door, yeah. doors for tennis. Yeah. So it just gives you opportunities. So have there been any learnings that you've had? Uh, we'll come to a lens in a second. Has there been any learnings that you've had engaging with parents where? Uh, you kind of top tips back to us of I've noticed that sometimes parents behave like don't that a couple of years down the line that's going to really trip you up or uh, parents don't tend to consider x y and z and you really need to before you start or um, your intentions are great uh, but your child isn't going to appreciate it a little later. are there kind of top tips around entering into say the collegiate system that you'd want to give any parents listening right now uh, advanced warning <laughs> as it were <laughs> Well, I just think for junior tennis initially, yeah, it's not pleasant. Yeah, so you just have to get you have to find a way through yeah. the minefield of the tournaments and the expense and the stress that it puts all of you under. But the rewards for it are huge. Mm. But you just have to get through. So as a parent, my mum and dad were just incredibly positive all the time and just supportive, which is hard when your child like I was is losing a lot and yep. you're paying it. so I For think the as a parent, <laughs> yeah so as a parent if you can kind of just sit down with everyone say okay what's our pathways what are our goals this is what's open to us and just support them through it as best you can great when you come out to America you are being treated well although there's loads of rules yeah, yeah. and the drinking rule and all that stuff the coach will not contact is that you no i do not know where oh i've got the phone <laughs> excuse me someone's left a phone in our house i do not know what on earth is ringing one second oh no it's gone off that was quite a pleasant tune that was nice what was that <laughs> a bit of an we've got friends over for the weekend and i think one of their daughters has left their phone around oh well She'll, and she hasn't realised. I know. Can you believe it? That's surprising. It's normally attached. Tempted to answer. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. But um, so going so going back to so when once you get over to America, so yep. the whole placement initially is it's stressful. So it's, it's another stress. Like if you're a twelve UTR boy or a nine UTR girl. The placement's going to be a little more enjoyable because yep. you are going to have coaches coming to you. They're going to be excited about you. You're going to get kind of swept up in it and signed for someone quite early on. Yeah. So it's and yes, there's a lot of form filling, but at least you feel as if the process is going somewhere. When your UTR is slightly lower, for me, I like to give my players more time to improve their UTR, <clears throat> but it means that someone who is a top player might get signed up in two weeks. My players who need more time to develop, it might take them a year yeah. to actually sign with a team, which if you can imagine the stress on a parent who's yep. just like, um, it's April and we're meant to be going in August, what's happening? And it's hard because I've been doing it 15 years, so I know exactly how the coaches work. And you know that, yes, it's April, but this is when they're going to start recruiting yep. this class of player. So trying to explain that, and and that's why I've always I'm a worrier. My family are all worriers. Making sure that if some a parent contacts me, I reply immediately. Yeah. Like I, I'll never have anyone having a sleepless night because they're worrying about their son and where he's going. So I think as a parent, you just always have to. If you're working with tennis smart, always reach out. If you yeah. have a worry, always reach out, ask a question. But the once the placement is over and you've gone through the rest of the applications, you've had enough of filling out every single form, 
once you get to America, the coach will not contact you if there's an issue. It'll be all kept in house. If the coach is contacting you, then you know there's there's a major problem going yeah. on. They like to deal with it with the player because they've seen as an adult. They're yep. their employee, yep. and that's where I come in. And if if a mum will say, "Oh, Charlie said this," the coach has said to him, "Is this something I should worry about?" I'll say, "No, that's normal." Don't worry. Oh, yep. actually, yeah, that doesn't sound right. Let me talk to the coach and just see. So for this process, you just got to know that it ebbs and flows here from a lot of people. It's a roller coaster ride, but you will get through it. And once they're there, if they're with Tennis Spark, we support them all the way through. Exactly. That's what I'm going to say. The advantage of having you with us in, in all of that. It's brilliant. Yes. Thumbs up all around for that. <laughs> so uh, we're just we're just coming into to a, a close now. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for for your time on this. This is um, particularly where we are. There's quite a few parents who are exploring this, but uh, and are quite keen on when this episode goes live. <laughs> and I know that Kath, uh, in her role uh, at the school, is really uh, enthused by the fact that uh, she's been able to have a conversation with you with, with some of the, with some of the players and hopefully connect you in. Um, last last bit from me really is. Is there, in all of your journeying in uh, tennis, is there one top tip? Maybe it was something brilliant your parents did or something you've observed another parent doing. What would be that golden nugget that you think, because courtside parents get a little bit of flack sometimes. Sometimes it's justified. Sometimes <laughs> I get a little bit grumpy. Um, what, what would be that golden kind of thing that you, through all of your career, that's the best thing a parent brings to a, to a person's game, their child's game? Um, well, for me, it was just having a balance in life. Yep. I had, I played tennis. I played every day. We yep. traveled most weekends to compete. I was at full-time school. Didn't particularly like school, but I knew it was a means to an end and had to do yep. it. Um, but then I had a social life. Now, it doesn't mean we're going out all the time, but at least I could go off to the cinema with my friends. And my yep. mum and dad were incredibly supportive of that. They would drive us there, make sure we were safe and everything. So it was just having a mum and dad who... Well, look, even now, the, the, they won't offer an opinion. or it's, yep. They're never going to be negative. They'll just be, well, you're mature enough to understand what you're doing. You can make a decision. We'll support you through it. And, and I didn't, at, at the time, I was, I've always, it was amazing when we were growing up because everyone wanted to come and hang out at our house. We were that house yep. that the kids wanted to be at. And it was just having that support where, if we had a tournament on at Tennis World, my mum would be like, all right, get everyone over. We'll make lasagna. And <laughs> and, and that's just, they're the fun memories. Yep. We'd go to Ilkley Tennis Tournament in our caravan with everyone else camping. And yep. that's what kept me going, yep. really. So it's just about having a balance and having a perspective that it's going to be stressful, yep. but it's stressful for everyone. And you just have to kind of get yourself through it. Yeah. And on that, we'll leave it on. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us on Courtside. It's a real pleasure. And if people want to get hold of you, how do they ask, how do they do that? Um, if you go to my website, www.tennismart.net, yep. all of my emails are there um, and WhatsApp and everything. But yeah, if, just always email me. And if, if I haven't responded within 24 hours, I didn't get it. So always <laughs> email back. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm off to, to cook up a palmo. Oh, lovely. I'm, I'm going home soon for one as well. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So welcome to the uh, courtside. Why do you always smile at me whenever I say this? Is this just put, just to put me off? Because you're meant to have a smile as you talk. Okay, I'm smiling. Because you come across more cheery because <laughs> you're miserable. You look like Gordon Brown <laughs> during his election campaign. That didn't go down too well. So welcome to the courtside reflection where Kath and I kind of mull over uh, kind of what we heard during the interview there with, with Sarah. Apart from the fact that it was great to speak to uh, a fellow teasider where we could share our love of all things the Palmo. Uh, what did you get out of the uh, interview? Firstly, I've had a Palmo and they're nothing much to speak of. No offence, offending fantastic. all the North East. For, for, for are they only in the North East? They are indeed. They're okay, a North sorry. Eastern delicacy. It is a, a fine piece of chicken that's then wrapped and smothered and smothered and smothered in more and more cheese uh, and then deep fried with breadcrumb on it. 
and uh, during the eating, whilst it is a fine experience, you do sense your heart giving up on you halfway through the meal. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> think that would be one that they would recommend before a match then for and nutrition. It, and everything within you screams out, oh, this is not a good idea, but it just tastes so good. Anyway, back to, on. Back to this, away from the northeast. Um, for me, with my role working in um, uh, an international school supporting students making sort of university choices, um, it was just really useful to to understand more about that that system, that process, and what the US universities opens up with with tennis. Um, and certainly, being in the area that we are in, yeah. um, there's certainly players that I come across where that is genuinely um, a, a direction of travel they want to pursue. Um, I liked how she talked about pathways, and that actually with tennis there isn't just one pathway. I think so often. Um, there is that focus on the pro circuit and totally get that and and that is the plan a for for most people however i think you know it is really important as parents and people that surround um the players that they are aware of other options um and that they don't just give up if yeah. if a plan a isn't working out yeah. actually there's so many other pathways that maybe they haven't thought through or considered but actually open up real possibilities and more importantly the ability to still be playing tennis and love it yeah. uh, and not to put the racket down and the the exposure and or to use another word the adventure of going to the states if if you're a brit or a, a, not a us resident that that kind of going to university overseas the experience of playing for some on pretty large campuses where you'll get turnouts watching you play that would rival quite a few ATP and W2A uh, tournaments. That's quite an experience, even if you don't meet maybe what your internal dream is to become the next or to become pro. You have in your 30s and your 40s looking back, when I was younger, I experienced all of this. And then having experienced that, what does that then do within you that opens up other pathways because your confidence will have grown through that yes your skills will have grown but just the, the breadth of experience for young people to encounter mm. during such a, uh, a college experience would be fantastic yeah and I think like you know she mentioned about the, that you're actually an employee mm. when you're on a scholarship based program you know playing the tennis or any sport isn't it in the US and Actually, I'd never really considered it in that way before that actually these students are going, but they're actually an employee uh, and therefore are learning um, amazing skills of effectively being in a workplace yeah. whilst doing their degree. Yeah. Um, and so often I read so many papers and reports about how uh, the world of work and you know students coming out with degrees what separates one from another um, but actually to have had that experience of almost being well being an employee but also uh, how employees will view um, the robustness of of a student who's yeah. had to a juggle a you know um, a lot of time pressures um, but the attitude that it takes on court the preparation the resilience all of those characteristics that often are referred to as sort of you know skills gaps that students have when they go into mm. the workplace so to have got those developed already um, or to be developing them again is a massive advantage yeah. uh, for post university as well into the world of exactly work. And as, as an employer you're then seeing on someone's cv that for the past three four five years they have been part of this uh, tennis uh, system which has demanded that if you turn up on time you're late so you arrive early uh, you, you'll be aware that sport you don't win every time so you've had to have built up resilience coping mechanisms all those kind of things to keep on going you will have been on a daily basis training towards goals these are all fantastic hallmarks of people who you'd want to employ so when you start looking at pathways but also employability when we start thinking of our kids is this an option for them this is another feather in their cap in an already competitive market that yes, I come out with a degree in business or whatever it might be, but also on my CV it says I'm someone who sticks at it. Uh, and that would be incredibly attractive to potential employers. Yeah, I think uh, certainly from my work hat point of view, anyone mm -hmm. who is considering that that pathway to America or even, you know, I don't know, I can't remember, she mentioned about the whole sort of apprenticeship route, mm -hmm. isn't it? Coaching, training, all of those other pathways that actually, uh, certainly for the US, you, you have got to start the process early. That doesn't yeah. mean becoming totally obsessed and nuts and that that's the only thing, but it's important to start thinking about that as a possible pathway early because uh, the American system uh, takes time 
um, to to access um, and to understand cause of the enormity of it. So to have people like Sarah as a specialist yeah. um, advising, um, and certainly again from my perspective, um, very much more reasonable um, <laughs> in terms of, of cost, but also uh, the longevity of support that once you're placed somewhere as well, the the ongoing support is fantastic because yeah. actually that's that's when that support is needed as well yeah. uh, to see them through their their employment as it were. Without a doubt. And then the, the bits coming a little bit off the court, although it does resonate with it, was there was two lines that Sarah said, and these have stuck with me during the week. Um, uh, the ability of growing into their game and the opportunity, I guess, whilst they're training hard, there'll be a lot of focus and it uh, about producing it in the matches. There is an ability uh, for students to continue to grow into their game in that environment where as if they are 17, 18, and then suddenly let's try my hand at the ATP tour. You've got to be on your game. Whereas this gives a little bit of a, a, a safety net, if you like, or more space to do that. But there's a part that Sarah said about herself that she'd realised that my emotional development hadn't caught up with my game yet. Mm. Uh, and that bit resonated with me a while, where as all young people continue to go through the turbulence of adolescence, certain aspects of character develop quicker than others, and there's continual learning going on. It just seems like within this collegiate system, there's an ability to keep developing as the player, but there's also the ability to develop emotionally as you're away from home, I'm in a different environment, the I am my alarm clock to get me up, it's not mum banging on the door, I've got to start taking responsibility myself. Uh, the studies also have to happen. But also the very uh, relational uh, and fun aspects that uh, college system provides, the ability to go out the social life. And also, so I'm, I'm emotionally growing and it gives a little bit more time uh, for me to develop, not suddenly have that instant pinch point of pressure of I'm 18 now, I'm going to try and make it whilst you're also still trying to find out who you are as an individual. So that was another appealing aspect for me as dad thinking, you know, would this be an aspect for Elijah one day? Well, actually the collegiate system would be another space that would hold him and allow him to grow even more, not just as a player, but as a person. Mm. Yeah, sorry, I got slightly distracted there. I was just looking at my hands going, they look really wrinkly. <laughs> I suddenly feel like I'm getting really old then. Um, as you're talking about all these great opportunities I, for young dull? people. Am I I've that just, dull, am I? No, I was just looking going, oh... Anyway, that's an aside, mate. <laughs> that's an Sorry aside. about that. Well, well, on that, as Jerry Clarkson would say, on that bombshell of your ever-aging hands, thank you all for, for listening to this podcast. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to catch hold of Sarah, then the details will be on the website. Uh, and if it is a, a pathway option uh, for, for your child, then all the best with that. And I hope uh, that uh, Sarah or whatever route you take are able to land you in the right college. I hope you enjoyed this episode and please do pass it around to your friends and wherever your sport takes you this weekend. We hope it's a good one. Bye.